Good evening. Can you hear me? It's on, but it's not up there. Am I coming? Okay, can you hear me easily? All right. <laughs> We're very glad to have you all here with us, and we're very proud of uh, the panel that we've assembled here this evening. It's almost an embarrassment of riches. Uh, I went over a period of time uh, inviting all of these uh, women in architecture uh, without realizing how many people we were getting to be and, and when we all got together. Uh, this is, this is what was put together, and I, I'm very excited about the diversity of the group. I think you'll find uh, a lot of interest, a lot of diversity in the backgrounds, in the work, in, in the approaches, in the philosophies, and I think all of this will come out as uh, each one of our guests will introduce herself and uh, talk about her work, her background, and so forth individually. Rather than my introducing each one formally, we, we really would prefer to have an informal kind of feeling here tonight. And uh, I will just let each person talk about herself and her work and anything you would like to say. The first speaker will be Lynn Paxton. There you go. There you go. Um, my name is Lynn Paxton, and Shelley kind of asked us to tell just a little bit about ourselves, so if you'll allow me to do that, I will. Um, I started out at the University of Michigan, and then I got my master's degree in Europe, hi, <laughs> and uh, at, uh, at a school in Hamburg, and I got a bachelor's degree in engineering as well. And then I came back here and worked for Neutra and Luckman, and then I opened my own office, and I now have an office in Santa Monica. Um, when I was going to school, I was very, um, I guess you would say idealistic. I can't think of a better term. I was really into, in fact, the reason I, as I was just, as we were discussing before, uh, the reason that I got into structural engineering and civil engineering was because I so admired the works of Nervi and Maya and Fray Otto. I met Nervi and of course being in Germany I was familiar with Fray Otto. And so I kind of wanted to, in my schooling days, be able to be professionally in a position to combine a functional expression with a structural expression, which is why I completed the studies in architecture as well as structural engineering. Then when I came back uh, to this country, and uh, started working for Neutra and then Lachman and then by myself, I found out, or at least the experiences that I had personally, led me to become quite pragmatic in my whole approach towards architecture, that is to say, translated, <laughs> business-like. <laughs> and my practice now is, is uh, run on that basis, and it's becoming more and more business-like, and I like to think professional. And what I mean by that is, I'll, I'll give you more specific examples since Shelley has allowed us each 10 minutes. <laughs> um, I, my company does mainly restaurants. Some of the work that we've done, uh, you can see in these renderings here, and uh, I'll get into that maybe just a little bit more in my time, but I want to kind of tell you what I've learned, I mean, as much as I can make it concise, and how I feel now about the profession of architecture. Uh, I, I have learned, it's been my experience, and, and, and I do feel that it is important to be able to run the business of architecture as a business. It is a business, and it is a service uh, provided for money. And this is the way I run my business, and I feel strongly that everyone should be aware that architecture is a business and should be run that way, and should inform themselves about the business aspects of architecture. Um, as far as uh, the way that we got into this commercial end of architecture and developed it more and more, um, personally, I started out doing house remodelings, and then that kind of evolved into bigger and bigger houses and 
finally into a million dollar house and from that um, we kind of jumped into restaurants by virtue of the fact that the owner of that house had restaurants and he was happy with my work. At that time I had five employees. Then um, we worked along and, and did a lot of restaurants and became a middle-sized firm, I guess, 23 people. And then, this is my firm I'm talking about. Um, I discovered by having a f uh, middle-sized office the importance of the business aspects of the office. The fact when you have 23 people working for you that you're no longer a designer. Uh, I mean, I was raised, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with or are experiencing the feeling that design is a very major part of being an architect, maybe, maybe even equated in your own minds with being an architect. And I found that I had quite a, um, a, a, a conflict of uh, my whole being, really, because I had been trained and brought up to think that an architect was a designer, and all of a sudden I had all these people working and there was no way that I could be a designer. I mean, there just was no way. And I had to cope with that, which I really hadn't been, been trained to cope with because I hadn't been trained in business at all. And, uh, and I found that very, very interesting and very difficult. And since then I've kind of concentrated on, on becoming more familiar with the, with the business aspects of architecture. Although I am the chief designer, I'm trying to train other designers, junior designers that work with me to take over that aspect and really getting into um, uh, setting up an architectural office that is sophisticated professionally and in a business sense. In other words, it's my present goal to further establish my own office as an office that uh, makes money and puts out quality work. And what I mean by quality work is, I want to just touch on these things that I've brought here for you today so that I can try to explain to you what I mean. Um, I've got, is it okay, would you mind, am I messing up <laughs> this whole thing? Let me give you this back, I'm not going to run over. <laughs> um, we, we do primarily restaurants. We've done 200 restaurants. and. Uh, after that, we do some shopping centers. We've done like maybe 10. And then we do hotels. We've done, oh, three, three hotels. So that's the kind of thing that we do, primarily restaurants. And I want to show you, just lift these up so that everybody can see them. The Long Beach Quiet Cannon. And here's, you, I want you to notice that these are all different styles, but in my opinion, uh, of quality. In other words, the styles that they are, this one I consider personally to be modern, and this one over here, this is the Scots Tail uh, Hungry Tiger. This is anachronistic. And then over there in the corner, I don't know if you can see them very well, but the one with the undulating ceiling is the Marina Hungry Tiger. And then this is another, the, the one that Enos lifting is another a Hamburger Hamlet. Uh, it's, a, it's a dining area and another hamburger hamlet. And what I wanted to kind of, what I'm trying to tell you by showing you these things is where we're at. We think in the commercial line of work that we're providing a quality product that is in line, and I think of it as a product, incidentally, that is in line with what the clients feel comfortable with and yet done in a manner that I, as an indiv individual, and everybody working in the company can feel proud of having been involved with it. And we're just, we're just trying to develop a more professional uh, group of people. This is another point that I personally think is important. My office is not me. My office is composed of quite a number of people, each one, right now, as it happens, is a really super person. You know, some people that we have are, have quite a number of years experience, and some people are just a couple years out of school, but they're all just really super. I mean, they're really good, and they're really going to go places, and every person is important in there. And it's not like a designer is more important than, than a, and a 
job captain or then a draftsman. And I really, I sincerely feel this, and those of you that know me know that I really feel this way. It's important, and if you're going to run architecture as a business, it's important to realize that the, it is a team effort. And all those stories in PA are really where it's at. It really is a team effort. It's not somebody sitting in a garret sketching up the most fantastic thing in the world. It's a team effort, and it's a business, and that's essentially all that I have to, to give you in my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Our next speaker is Claire Forrest. Claire Forrest. Uh, Claire Forrest. Is that it? Uh, very briefly, my way into architecture came through my original training as a textile designer. And I practiced as a textile designer for several years, and then my head got a little bit too big for my, uh, what's the word? I can't think of it right now, but I wanted to move on to larger things, and I started to study architecture in New York, and then returned from New York to London and practiced for 10 or 12 years in London, uh, building a range of buildings, ranging from restaurants, hotels, uh, through finally to doing a lot of work in educational facilities. From there I came to California and practiced in the Bay Area in health services planning for five or six years and also taught during that time uh, part-time at Berkeley and in Oregon and currently I'm teaching at USC. I brought with me uh, some uh, visuals which what I would like to do is just very briefly, very quickly go through um, the range of projects I've been involved in, and I won't go into much detail, but it'll just give uh, an idea of that range. Uh, I won't go into detail because there isn't time to. I don't know. This is a, oh, two things that work here. Uh, just a locational plan of several of the projects I was responsible for the design and construction of in the London area. And these are primarily restaurants and schools and some housing which I didn't design but was in charge of construction of. Uh, this is the kind of uh, found buildings that we were working with in terms of the restaurants and hotels. Uh, this was one pub that um, I rehabilitated, although in many instances they were actually completely new projects that were built from the ground up. This was a typical client for uh, most of these restaurants and pubs that I did initially in architecture. I, this, I'm going through this chronologically. And these are just from now on just some interiors of various of the restaurants and shops and uh, pubs that I did. This is in the 50s, so this style is rather reminiscent of the 50s <laughs> architecture. Uh, these are just locating the three schools I, I was involved in the design and construction of in the outer London area. plans of a new high school that was in addition to an existing uh, Dudok type 30s school. Central uh, meeting place, two-story meeting place, quadrangle plan, two levels with the classrooms and seminars opening off the central meeting place, which was also the multi-purpose theatre. My slides, I have to apologize for, they're all reproduced from publications because my color selection of slides was stolen from my office at the university. This is a plan of a clinic I did in London along with um, another two people, one of whom was Jim Sterling's wife. Two women and a man put this one together. <laughs> and I was involved in, you probably know, the Barbican uh, redevelopment in London, which 
uh, was a very large redevelopment project that took about 15 years from initiation of the competition after the war. It was an area near St. Paul's Cathedral that was completely bombed. It took about 15 years from design to occupation, and I was involved in the last phase of that, which was the high-rise housing plan of the scheme. Uh, I'm a little frustrated at not being able to get into detail, but there really isn't time. This is the Barbican built. The high riot housing in the background is the, pro the phase of the development I was involved in. Then I came to California and, and worked with a large firm of hospital planners in San Francisco who had opened up a research and development team uh, just a year prior to my joining them. And they were into regional health services planning um, at the county-wide or state-wide level, we were defining the full range of health needs for a given population relative to the available health services in the area in order to identify the unmet health needs. Then from that, begin to define a strategy of location of facilities by type, depending on the medical category, and then program and design these facilities. Uh, these slides from now on in are really largely charts that talk about the way in which we went about the health planning, and this is a point at which I moved away from facility design into planning. Um, it was a deliberate move on my part because I was still suffering from that megalomania of wanting to have more and more and more control over the decision-making, having got frustrated from the textile design end right through to regional planning, I then ended up teaching. <laughs> so these, these slides are really just delineating a strategy that I used. I had working with me a computer programmer and a statistician, and there was a very definite policy to involve community groups in the definition of need uh, for health services in an area because we were, as it happened, all the projects I was involved in were for low income, for the low income uh, health range of um, population group and the range of health services specifically for that group. It was uh, nearly always county uh, health services we were working for or with. Uh, this just a slide to illustrate the area of concern that regional, our regional planning had to encompass in terms of the different communities of interest, which crossed legislative boundaries and crossed uh, physical barriers and so on. Uh, population projections, which we developed a sophisticated, oh, back to front, that's good. Sophisticated means of uh, d uh, defining the health needs expected from a given population number uh, adjusted for uh, age and sex and income group and ethnic background. We also went into great analysis of existing services, analysis of utilization of existing facilities and services in the area. So from that we could identify the unmet need and therefore program new facilities. Um, kinds of needs that we would look locate through talking and working with community groups. This is commu uh, consumer input into the planning process. Uh, just rain, uh, defining the needs in terms of sheer numbers and then moving um, on into facility location. This, uh, for the county of Hawaii, we did this type of work and I'll just now move, we, in all instances we're delineating optional long-range planning policies and immediate short-range policies and then evaluating each of the options and recommending one in light of the criteria that we had set and then uh, also organizational stru structures, ways in which these plans could be implemented over time and what the capital cost would be and the first year initiating and administration of, of the programs. Uh, County of Santa Barbara, we did this for also. Same thing, delineating options. All of this with consumer input and all the health agencies in the area having input. 
and another for South Central LA. At the time of Martin Luther King, I managed to do these very well. <laughs> well, just discussing the different forces acting on the health service, different options again available to the hospital, different uh, strategy for uh, delivering health care and taking the outpatient component of health care into a series of satellite health centers that uh, served a core inpatient hospital at the regional scale of two, about 180,000 to 200,000 population. Uh, secondary options that are detailed programs. Uh, it's very summarmatic, but I think I've probably used my 10 minutes, so I'll pass on to the next person. Thank you, Claire. It was a shame you had to rush through some of those nice things. Uh, our next speaker is Margot Siegel. Hello. I think what I will do is take a slightly different tack since uh, our, one of the topics we were told that we'd talk about tonight is uh, uh, the role of women in architecture rather than just architects. Uh, so I'll give you my background. First of all, it was pretty conventional. I went to to a School of Architecture. I got my degree from Pratt Institute in Architecture, but Architecture was my third major. Uh, when I got out of high school, I didn't have too clear an idea of what I wanted to do. It was certainly not Architecture, which I'd never heard. So I started school as a fine arts major. I was going to go into sculpture. And then I decided that uh, starving in a garret wasn't my image. I'd better do something more practical. So. Eventually, I wound up in architecture, which looked like a nice combination of uh, sculpture on a larger scale for which you could get paid. And uh, that seemed uh, a nice arrangement to me, except that uh, when I wanted to transfer into architecture, I ran into some problems. Since a senior design critic of the school to whom I went for advice, I uh, felt that women didn't belong in architecture. And uh, he told me so in no uncertain terms. He said, uh, if you insist on transferring, I can't keep you out because you have the grades. But um, uh, we had a three and a half year battle before I got through and I just uh, graduated more in stubbornness than on any other quality that uh, I could mention. Then I started to work and this was back east, this was in New York. Uh, there was one difference between New York and the West Coast which was that uh, there was really no difficulty getting work because uh, anybody who walked in was just considered like another piece of office equipment and if you could do the work that was all right. When I came out here to the West Coast I found that life was different. Here uh, I tried to get a job and uh, uh, people would hold the door for me and offer me a seat, but I couldn't get a job, you know. <laughs> it was a slight practical problem. Um, after a while, I uh, even I got onto the idea that there was a group called the Association of Women in Architecture that did an annual survey of which offices uh, hired women. And the reason for that was in many offices you'd spend the time and fill out the form, and they'd just file it in a circular file. And if the secretary was nice, she'd tell you not to bother. So um, eventually I did get a job, of course, and uh, I found that uh, there was, uh, you have to realize that I got out of school 21 years ago, so things are changing a little bit, but uh, even so, I found that there, um, if I had been a man with the same amount of background and experience, I would have advanced. And as it was, uh, part of it, I suppose, was really my own fault. I more or less accepted that I was a second-rate citizen. And uh, I couldn't manage to get into, say, an associateship or management position. So eventually, it, uh, I finally decided that uh, the only thing, the only option really open to me was to open my own office, which I did fairly recently. This is only my fourth year. And frankly, the reason I didn't do it earlier was that I just didn't have the guts. I had no social connections, no client waiting for me in the background, no independent means of income. So it seemed like a risky proposition. So eventually, 
I decided to give it a try, which I think is the greatest thing I ever did. I just wish I'd done it 10 or 15 years earlier. And I might have a story to tell like Lynn, you know. Uh, as it is, I have a small operation which I'm trying to build up, and uh, I think my timing wasn't ideal. I mean, things right now aren't exactly uh, in the best state for architects, but I'm an optimist. Uh, besides, I'm very stubborn anyhow, so I'll hang in there. And I think that there's just nothing more exciting than being an architect. And I think also there's just nothing more exciting than having your own office. At least you're free to make your own mistakes, of which you make plenty. It's, it's a learning process. Uh, certainly what they teach you in school, at least when I went to school, it may be different nowadays, but I doubt it, is uh, they don't really teach you too much about the practical realities of uh, how to get a client, how to negotiate a fee, how to get a job out on time, you know, a few little practical things, how to collect your fee once you've earned it. Uh, there's some uh, niceties there, you know, and which I'm in the learning process too, and I imagine it'll be a long learning process. Um, I have a few slides to show some things that I've done, but uh, um, what I'm showing you is not what I did for other offices. So they're small projects, but uh, as I said, I, I'm hoping for bigger and better things. So if you want to turn the lights off. Is it up to me? Do I move this thing forward? There Oops. you go. Go, right. back Let me go back. Okay, this is a community center and playground in Los Angeles. Whoops, you went I went back there. too far. I'll get the hang of this. <laughs> um, this was uh, in South Central Los Angeles. It's rather interesting because the site was donated by a factory which is across the street to the community. And uh, this project, as you can see, is well utilized by the kids. And it's a very rewarding project. On the right, you see in the background, there is the, the uh, pitched roofs of the factory. This is the inside, which has some open trusses in the skylight. Um, they have a tremendous number of events in this building, which is really a thrill to see. This is a chapel in San Diego, and these are some other views of it here. These, they didn't have money for stained glass windows, so I selected a pattern, which doesn't show off too well here, of different patterns of glass colors and just stuck in a louver window. It works very nicely. It gives you really bright colors on the inside. This here is a building that was built in 1898. It was, uh, it's in Englewood. It was once a big farmhouse and had an enormous farm. Uh, this has now been converted to a clinic, a community clinic, for crippled children. And uh, the uh, landscaping isn't in yet. You get an idea. Uh, the idea was to preserve the look of the building and give it a residential feel rather than more institutional feel. This is a master plan for a recreation complex in the city of Lawndale on property that belongs to school. Actually, there are two schools on this site, and they had some 17 acres that uh, they really couldn't maintain. So this was to locate on this site both all the recreation facilities that the school needed and as well as the community. There would be an aquatic center that would be built by the Y, community center, and the senior citizens, as are all the purple buildings on the lower right, and a gym eventually. And the interesting thing about this project was that it, this is now three, a little over three years since I got involved with this. All this period of time has been uh, in having meetings with the committee, which had representatives on it from the council, the school board, the Y, the Little League, 
and every other group in the community you ever heard of, and then all the presentations that were made all over the community, uh, sometimes two and three times before the same group, till now they finally got to the point where the school district and the city council have negotiated a joint powers agreement and something might actually get done on this project. It, uh, it was an amazing experience. This is a small commercial building in San Diego, and the uh, thing about this one was uh, to provide some sun shielding for very little money, and the, the uh, building's been repainted. These aren't the original colors, unfortunately, but uh, the idea was to provide some inexpensive sun shielding and an entrance that was a little more intriguing than it would normally be. It's a, uh, to put planning in here and have a skylight up above to give a little excitement. This is a residence in, in Pasadena. It was a custom mailbox for it. It's a side view. It's on a steep hillside and has a pool in here and a, a view of the whole city in the background there. Um, I'm using a piece of another slide tray, so I have just uh, so what I could fit into the slide tray. Anyway, these, those, are the photograph, those are the photographs, just to give you a slight idea. Um, I think I'm not going to say too much more. I hope there's going to be some discussion. But um, all I can say is uh, I think you're in the right profession. It, uh, it has a lot of rewards. And I think it was the best decision I ever made was to get into it. Thank you, Margo. Next, we have Inga Rose. I'm Inga Rose. Um, I don't have any visuals. I more of an attitude that I want to share with you because it's different than most other people's attitude. But I'm going to start with my education first. I started off as a, as a math and science major. Uh, my father was a scientist and he thought I should follow in his footsteps. Being the number one daughter, actually I think many times he thought I was number one son. And if it wasn't for that attitude, most likely, I would not have had the family atmosphere to go into architecture or to go into a profession. Uh, after three years of math and science, I decided that it was, it had no imagination to it. And architecture was a nice combination of uh, the math, the science, the practical. It was just a good all-around combination. So with the background of math and science, I ended up with a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Engineering. After I graduated from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, I, start, I worked in San Luis Obispo for architects, engineers, contractors, anybody that um, had work, because times were already starting to get a little on the rough side in 1966, so that it was a matter of who had work and where uh, the dollar could be found. I, after four years working there, I came to Los Angeles because work had dried up, and I started to work for the county of Los Angeles. I started off as draftsman, pencil pusher, and in the last six years I've gone through job captain, uh, project architect, construction project manager, which is, uh, this is my uniform, <laughs> and uh, I just recently found out I'm going to now be a facilities project manager, which is taking care of the project from its original inception um, with, with designers, be they designed by the county in-house, or be they designed by outside architects, where we follow the project through from the beginning, negotiating the fee, uh, budgeting, the whole thing, all the way through the final construction. Uh, working for the county can be two different things. It can be uh, whatever you make out of it. Uh, a lot of people say a lot about government. It can be that. For me, it's been an excellent opportunity to uh, have a chance to do work. I've been given every opportunity. Um, I was 
I want to say lucky, fortunate, that when I was given an opportunity that I could do the work and thus prove myself in little steps and have been able to um, succeed in moving up. Um, pencil pusher to uh, project manager in six years, um, I want to facetiously say, even for a guy, it's bad. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not your, um, I'm not a women's liver. I, I don't believe in, in it, as a matter of fact. Um, I don't believe in quotas. Uh, I believe in quality, performance, um, an attitude. You have to like being a person because architecture is, is not, it's not a separate thing. It's not something you do from eight to five. Eight to five. Architecture is, is part of your life. And uh, I like architecture. Uh, I don't happen to be a good designer. Uh, I'm a better manager. So I've gotten into what I can do. Uh, there's no point in, you know, beating a dead horse. <laughs> it's just not going to get across the finish line. Uh, I think a person, guy, gal, you have to have pride. Uh, you have to have confidence. You have to work hard. It, it just doesn't matter who you are. Uh, if you're not willing to put out, you know, don't hold your hand out. If you're going to hold a hand out, make it a dirty hand that's done some work. Uh, there's never been a job that I haven't been willing to tackle. Uh, I find if, especially if it's a difficult project, if I get in and do it first and start it off, uh, the guys and the other people on the project will step right in and help you. Um, sometimes uh, it's some work that you wouldn't have asked somebody to do, but once they see you doing it, they'll, uh, they'll do it with you. Uh, architecture is a lot of uh, human relations, uh, dealing with clients, dealing with contractors. Uh, I work with contractors now, and yeah, you, know, you can walk on the job and they look at you. You know, I wanted some answers. I wanted, I wanted some help here. What they send me that chick for? And you know, you look at it and you laugh. You know, you you, you can chuckle inside. It's if you've got the sense of humor, they're going to go with you. And you say, in your mind's eye, you say, fine, that's good. You can think that. But after you, if you're confident and after you've worked with these people for a little while, um, they're going to change. They're going to evaluate you for your performance. Uh, I will admit that girls have a slight disadvantage that if a man comes on the job, he's accepted automatically. Whereas a woman has to prove herself a little bit more. But when she's earned that respect, it's truly respect. It's not an automatic thing. So that you can be, you can be proud and happy uh, for the reaction that you've gotten. Let's see, I, I want to share some of these attitude things. Uh, to me, it's positive attitude. You, know, you, you go out and you smile at somebody. And the reaction is going to be a smile. You go out and frown at somebody, they're going to frown back at you. So this attitude uh, goes through. Uh, I guess my disagreement with, with some of the uh, women's lib movements as a total has been that too often there's a chip on the shoulder, that the attitude is, um, I'm a woman, so that's why they didn't take me. Whereas, you know, the, there are a lot of guys that have been turned down for jobs, too. And uh, if you go in with a good attitude and not a chip, you know, it's like anybody. You go out on the street and one morning, you've got a chip on your shoulder. First guy you meet is going to knock it off for you. Um, let's see. It's so easy to think of these things. <laughs> when you're not on mic. When you're not on mic. <laughs> The attitude, uh, performance, quality, uh, a good background. Uh, once I got started at the county, they claimed they had a continuing education program, which they really, 
it looks good in the literature. And I applied for it, but uh, me and all the guys, we got turned down. And I went to SC at night and got a Master's of Science in Civil Engineering. Um, I got my architectural registration while I was working. I'm active in the AIA now on a program to change the public's attitude about the architect. Um, an architect is considered uh, a designer, an artist, more than a professional producing a product. <laughs> and through um, public appearances, as far as letting the, whenever you meet someone, letting them know that you are an architect, that you are a person of quality, that this will hopefully influence people to think of you as a professional. If you behave as a professional, I feel that they will react to you as a professional. Um, one of the vehicles I've been using is uh, I'm, I do a fairly decent job in handling a camera. I've had one in my hand, I guess, since I built my first one at age 10. And I use it to the camera to show people the environment around them, to show them buildings that are in the process of being uh, torn down or that have some significance. I've been into the historical preservation or the recycling, rejuvenation, whatever you want to call it, a reusing of buildings which have a potential. Using, uh, discussing these things, whether or not you should re reuse a building, uh, what criteria you should use. Um, to get out in front of the public in a way that they will think of you in a positive manner. Um, I've used the AIA or the, been associated with the AIA. I belong to a small group, not Southern California chapter. I belong to the Pasadena chapter. and. Um, Shelley's got an article here uh, on the um, task force study of women in architecture, and it says that um, the women weren't uh, accepted very well by the AIA or by the different chapters. And I know in, in Pasadena, I've never had that problem. Uh, we all get together for the fellowship, uh, the association of talking and. Uh, it's more the fellowship that we're all together there for than um, anything else. I guess we're going to talk about the task force study later. Mm. Okay, well, for now, that's all I've got. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Ina Dubna. Um, I'm an architect. I graduated from USC, and I have a master's from Columbia. Um, and I've worked in various offices, both here in New York. I worked for Skidmore in New York and put in my time for my apprenticeship at uh, William Pereira in Los Angeles. Um, when I went to USC in the uh, late 50s, the world was really a different place from what it is now. And it's really interesting being in a school now and comparing it to, to what being in a school was like then. Uh, the world really looked good then. It was peaceful and the... Uh, and the economy was expanding, and there was plenty of work to go around for everybody. We were, we were taught and we believed that good design was what was important, and that, and that if we could do good buildings, we would be enriching people's lives, and that that was really a worthwhile pursuit. And, and we believed that, and we believed a lot of other things without questioning at all. And um, I have some slides here that um, maybe tell a little bit about my pursuit for, for those ideals. We have the lights. Okay. Okay. Uh, this was the first house that I did. Uh, it's a house in Pasadena. Um, I think you can see the see the USC influence in it. At that time. At that time, right? The 1950s <laughs> USC. Uh, at that time, we didn't think about cutting down redwood trees, and I think there must be at least a whole redwood tree in this house.
The other interesting thing about this house was the fact that it was a it was a moderately priced house at the time, and it was possible to build a house with these materials and this kind of detailing at the time, and and any middle income person could have afforded a custom house like this then. And of course now it would be impossible for anybody but a, a very wealthy person to afford such a house. And many of the many of the practicing architects then were a major part of their work was this sort of this sort of residence for for just sort of ordinary people. And of course now that's a whole market that we had all hoped to get into that, that is almost non existent. Uh, the next thing I did uh, was to associate with a group of uh, people that I'd gone to school with to do this, this school. Unfortunately, I don't have very many slides of it. In fact, this is the only one. Uh, it was a simple, straightforward job that we, that we did under a lot of um, kind of difficult circumstances having to do with the way the building was funded and the kind of regulations that we had to work with. Again, it was a, a simple, what we considered well-designed building for, for the time. Then the same group of people that I associated with um, had been watching what was happening in Los Angeles at the time. Um, little cracker box apartments springing up everywhere, studs and stucco, um, providing really inadequate housing, they felt. And these were mostly being done without architects and being built by, by developers. And so they decided to go into developing themselves and see if they could really do, do that same game and yet really provide the kind of good design and planning and privacy and views and outdoor spaces and all the things that they believed were important uh, for the same kind of cost that the developers were doing. Um, they started working on the Marina Peninsula. Well, that was the second place, actually, that they started working. And this was one of the buildings that they built there. I became involved in these later, uh, although unfortunately not in the profits involved. And at the time we started, there were um, there were almost no other buildings in this area, and little by little the area got built up, and there's now this solid wall of building that goes from one end of the Marina Peninsula to another. The prices are now very high. Land, land values skyrocketed from the beginning. Um, I think even Ray's in there under construction down, ah. in, the, down in the corner there. And this, this peninsula that you, that you can see here is now just solid buildings, one, one from one end to another. Uh, and I think it's a really unique piece of property, and, and I really questioned what we had gotten involved there, although it was probably inevitable. Uh, I really think about how that piece of land might have been used to really benefit the city in a much better way. It's, re it's really unfortunate, I think, what happened to it. But at the time, we were still, you know, we were still in that belief that good design was what counted, and we were really interested in doing that kind of architecture. Um, the marina was a reality at that time, and we were heavily involved in, in the marina through, the, through that work on the, uh, on the peninsula. And at that time, uh, the chance for it to do a, a really big job came along, this, which is now Washington Square. It's a commercial complex um, with office buildings, shops, um, restaurants, um, and a supermarket. And it was really an ideal job in every way, and we were, we were very happy to get the opportunity to, to do a job of this scale. There were only five of us in the office, and three of us actually executed the job. And we really felt that since most of the, work, most of the buildings that had been going up in the marina were pretty inferior, that it was a chance to maybe bring something a little different and, and of higher quality to the area. So we took a lot of care with detailing and tried to make it as interesting as possible and create a variety of spaces. And, get in some landscaping and color and all those other things that we thought were really important. But at the same time, I began to, to really wonder again about, um, about whether this was the right thing to do because, because of how it was influencing the, the existing neighborhood. At the time the building was being designed, it was under construction, there were picket lines forming across the street in the Venice Canal area. The residents were protesting the construction of this project and of course everything else that was going on in the area because, because prices were coming up and, and it was influencing their neighborhood in a way that, that they felt was really hurting, hurting their values and their lifestyle and their, and their, their, level of, their income level. And it's certainly true, and it was a conflict for me because although I was very interested in the, in the building and getting the building up because that was what I, I wanted to do and that's what, what I believed in doing, at the same time I knew that if I, weren't in, 
if I wasn't actually involved in this particular building, I would be very sympathetic to, to their cause. Um, at the same time as we, that we were doing this uh, Washington Square project, we, as a kind of side trip, we're interested in sailing, and we uh, had the idea to to design a, a, a very low-cost, lightweight, completely collapsible sailboat that could be transported on a car easily. And we eventually got this design patented. It's a, made out of a tetrahedron of aluminum pipes with three hulls. We eventually built a full-scale model and a, and a little one that you see here. Uh, the full-scale model was stolen, and we eventually ran out of funds. So that was the end of that project. The other thing that I got into um, during that period was a lot of drawing and painting on my own, which was a really wonderful kind of escape from, from the realities that I was dealing with on Washington Square, because it's, it's a kind of way to get into really pure design without, without dealing with people and costs and codes and contractors and all of those things. Um, after, after Washington Square was finished up, the partnership that I was working with um, was being reorganized and reforming. And at that time, I had to make the decision whether I wanted to join the new partnership or not. And um, it was a hard decision to make, but, I, but since I, I had been questioning all the work that, that we were doing and, and thinking that there must be a better way to practice architecture, in a way that, um, that I could feel good about it in every way, because I, I had always felt pretty good about what we had done in terms of design and, and solving the problem architecturally, but there was always a, a lot of doubt in my mind about you know, whether the building should have been built in the first place or whether it was really, really a good influence on the community or a bad influence on the community. So uh, I wanted to go into different kinds of things that I, that I could feel good about in, in every aspect, not just in some, some aspects. And so the, the, pe the rest of the people really wanted to pursue more of the same kind of work and weren't interested in exploring new, new paths. So I decided to not join the partnership, not become a partnership partner in the firm, and to take some time out to reevaluate my stand on, on where I was at in architecture, even though I didn't have a clear plan about what I was going to do. And um, shortly thereafter, the opportunity came to teach it at SciArc, so I, I did that and. And uh, for the first year, it was kind of difficult because, um, because I felt that I was teaching in a way that, that I had been taught, and I was teaching a lot of the things that, that I was questioning myself. So, um, so that was kind of a problem for me to get, to get into it in that way. Uh, I felt that my relationship to the students um, as a teacher was kind of arbitrary, and that uh, working on um, artificially contrived projects was was difficult because um, because I was making it up and the answers were made were made up as well. The projects weren't real and there was no way to to make decisions dealing with the kind of real real issues that come up when you're doing real projects. So out of that um, came the idea for the community design studio, which which we're now doing, which I feel a lot better about because it's devoted to doing real projects and working with real people. And so the students then have to. Um, decide as a group, and I'm just a member of the group, um, the students have to decide as a group what projects they want to take on and then how they're going to approach solving the projects and, and deal with whatever comes up as it comes up. And nobody has the answers and nobody knows uh, from the beginning how it's going to turn out in the end. And we just follow the project through as it comes and, and we don't know in the end whether, whether there'll be a product or what kind of product. And, um, and I'm hoping that out of this maybe we can, we can find some ways that some ways to practice architecture, maybe some ways to, to work at it that are they're, they're a little different and maybe a little more relevant to what's going on now that, that work isn't happening for architects the way that it once did. And there are a lot of new problems to be solved and I think new, new forms of, um, of working have to be found to, to meet those ways. So I feel very positive about that now. I guess that's all. Thank you, Ina. I'm glad you showed your drawings. Really lovely.
Our next speaker is Margo Heyman. <laughs> I've enjoyed hearing everybody go before me. And I think I share a little bit with everybody, different experiences. Um, share with uh, Inga being sort of like number one, uh, the only child, and therefore my family sort of directed that I should go in a career. I suppose uh, that might not have normally been the case in, in some other family. I came from an artistic background. My father's a sculptor. And maybe I felt that was, you know, since the topic is women in architecture, I, I guess for some reason it seemed more natural that a man be a sculptor and I had to go somewhere else. Um, I was always interested in law and math but it didn't seem that creative. I was searching for something that would essentially allow me to use a technical background and law as well as the artistic background. And somehow by the age of 13, I knew I wanted to be an architect without knowing what that meant. So I directed my, my energies that way. I had the opportunity, <clears throat> because my father's a sculptor, he went to the American Academy in Rome. So I spent my high school years in Italy being greatly influenced by Baroque architecture, by grand plans. I think I'm still very influenced by the great Baroque architecture and grand plans. Um, my first experience of the situation of a woman in architecture was being accepted at Cornell University. They accept 64 out of 64. They make it a point to accept at least five females. They don't expect them to complete the course. My particular year was unusually stubborn. We only lost one of the women. We graduated 16 out of the 64. Um, during my tra training, I also went back to Rome for one year, to the University of Rome. And one thing that I've noted is that Europe is much more accepting of women in architecture. I don't know how many of the other women here have experienced a social occasion and, and saying, um, you know, I'm an architect. And they say, gee, I've never met a lady architect before. <laughs> you know, how would you get that way? You know, when I've been in Rome, um, I say, I'm an architect, and they say, oh, really? Now, what do you think of such and such a building? We get into a lovely philosophical discussion, and I really like that. Um, I also found that when I was studying at the University of Rome, at least a third of the students were female, and a major portion of the instructors were female. Again, I share with, uh, you know, the fact that I think we were about the same time, you know, the the great dreams of what were to come, tremendous emphasis in design and doing great things. And uh, it, it's just sort of an interesting experience coming out of that. Uh, Cornell is terribly cold. There's snow right on through April. And I decided, as soon as I finished, I had to come to California. People said, you didn't have a job? I said, no, I just had to get out of the snow. And I came right here without a job. And um, again, my first experience in looking for a job was possibly a, a very negative one. It was, it was an interesting one. It was a, uh, I answered an ad in the paper. And um, that time, we asked for something like $100 a week. And I asked for $100, and the architect said, fine. Went after his secretary, we're hiring Margot here at $100 a month. And I said, okay. <laughs> that's not what I meant. You know. Anyway, that was one of a kind of experiences. Um, <laughs> part of my background back, I had worked in New York City for Abraham Geller, who was also marvelously philosophical architect. He had won a number of awards for the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Monument and various other things. I had worked up in Toronto, Canada, for a residential architect who had won a number of awards, Joe Markson. 
came out here after that initial experience. I worked for a company. Don't really know. I, I learned an awful lot about all the architects in the city by walking the streets. It's, I think it's a marvelous experience just being able to go into various offices with your portfolio and saying, this is me, this is what I can do. Um, I was very stubborn that way. I never wanted anybody to say, you know, put me in some place. I always had to feel that I got the work myself because of me, whatever, whatever that all means. And I ended up in an office called Checks and Johnson, which at that time did um, a combination of a lot of Catholic work and department stores. They predominantly do department stores today. But my first building, which I'm still very much in love with, is a convent. And these sisters lived in what was classified a garage. Consequently, they had no money. They had uh, $80,000 to build a convent. And I will show it to you shortly, but I just want to emphasize that uh, the other thing I should say, too, is though I was working in an office, the fact that there was no money and I was out of school, nobody paid attention to what I was doing. The next convent I did, which was into the millions of dollars, uh, became neoclassical. Because as you know, it has to look rich. It has to have that classic form.